I supposed Steerforth had said what he did in jest, in order to draw Miss Dartle out. When the ladies retired to the drawing room, and we two were sitting before the fire, I half expected him to say so. But I was disappointed. Cigar, Daisy? No. No, thank you, Steerforth. What? No vices yet? <laughs> of course not. I should have guessed as much. <laughs> So, now you've met my family. What did you think of Rosa Dartle? She's very clever, isn't she? And she does play like an angel. Clever? But an angel? No. She brings everything to a grindstone and sharpens it. <laughs> She's worn herself away by constant sharpening. She's all edge. That's a remarkable scar on her lip. Why... The fact is, I did that. Uh, an accident? No. I was a young boy, and she exasperated me, and I threw a hammer at her. Oh. A promising young angel I must have been. I'm sorry, I... <laughs> She's borne the mark ever since, and she'll bear it to her grave. If she ever rests in one, I can't believe she'll ever rest anywhere. She's an orphan, daughter of my father's cousin. She has a couple of thousand a year of her own. That's her history for you. And I've no doubt she loves you like a brother. <laughs> Some brothers aren't loved over much. Help yourself to Port Copperfield. Before we join the ladies, we'll drink to the daisies of the field in compliment to you, <laughs> and to the lilies of the valley that toil not, neither do they spin in compliment to me. The more shame to me. It was not your throw, James. Rosa, I've caught you out. You've not been paying... My son tells me that it was at Indeed. Mr. Creakle's school that you first got acquainted, Mr. Copperfield. He was very generous and noble to me in those days, ma'am. And I stood in need of such a friend. He is always generous and noble. Indeed he is. It was not a fit school, generally, All for my son. But there were particular circumstances... My son's high spirit made it desirable he should be placed with some man who felt its superiority and would be content to bow before it. We find such a man there. James was the monarch of the place, and he determined to be worthy of his station. It was like him. Yes, it was like him. So my son took, of his own will, to the course in which he can always, when he pleases, outstrip every competitor. <laughs> My son tells me, Mr. Copperfield, that you were devoted to him. And that when you met yesterday, you wept tears of joy. Yes, I did. I should be affected if I pretended to be surprised that James should inspire such emotion. But I can't be indifferent to anyone who appreciates his merit so much. I'm very glad to see you here. I can assure you he feels great friendship for you. You can rely on his protection. Very well, Rosa. I accept your surrender. Daisy, I think I will come down to the country with you. In about a week, perhaps? You can stay here a week? Please do, Mr. Copperfield. Thank you very much. Of course I should like to do that. Mr. Copperfield, James calls you Daisy. Is it a nickname? Where does he give it to you? Is it... I'm so stupid in these things. Is it because he thinks you young and innocent? I... I believe it is. Oh, I'm glad to know that. I ask for information and I'm glad to know it. He thinks you young and innocent. And so you are his friend. Well, that's quite delightful. When I went to my room that night, I saw there was a portrait of Miss Dartle looking at me from above the chimney piece. To get rid of her, I undressed quickly, put out the light and went to bed. But I couldn't forget she was still there, looking at me. Steerforth had a manservant called Littimer. He was taciturn, soft-footed and quiet, but above all, he was respectable. He was in my room every morning before I was up to bring me the shaving water I was ashamed of not yet needing and to put out my clothes. He made me feel deplorably young. Oh. 
Come in. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Littimer. Your shaving water, sir. Oh, oh thank you. Uh, Mr. Steerforth will be glad to hear how you have rested. Thank you. Uh, very well indeed. Is Mr. Steerforth quite well? Oh, thank you. Mr. Steerforth is tolerably well. Is there anything more I can have the honor of doing for you, sir? Uh, nothing. Thank you. I thank you, sir, if you please. Every morning we held exactly this conversation. And every morning, in the presence of this man, I became, as it were, a boy again. A delightful week passed by, and then, as planned, I travelled with Steerforth to Yarmouth. We arrived late and put up at the inn. Next morning, Steerforth was in great spirits. He had been strolling about the beach before I was up and made the acquaintance of half the boatmen in the place. And what's more, I've seen your Mr. Peggotty's house. That is, I'm sure I have. A boat on the beach? Yes. With smoke coming out of the chimney? That's the one. <laughs> I was tempted to walk in on them and swear I was you, grown out of all knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> when did you propose to introduce me that day? I thought this evening, when they're all sitting around the fire. Very well, this evening. I won't give them notice we're here. Let's take them by surprise. <laughs> of course. Let's see the natives in their aboriginal condition. <laughs> Though they are... That sort of people. That sort of... <laughs> of course. <laughs> you remember my passage at arms with Rosa, confound her. I'm half afraid of that girl. <sighs> Let's not talk about her. Now, tell me, what are you going to do? Well, I must see Peggotty, first of all. Suppose I deliver you up to be cried over for a couple of hours. <laughs> Is that long enough? Yes. But you must come, too. I've talked so much about you... She want to meet you. I'll come anywhere you like. Let's meet in two hours' time. I'd like to look at the town first. <laughs> Bacchus, you'll never guess who this is. Hi. Oh, good evening, sir. <laughs> Don't you know me, Mr. Bacchus? You knew me well enough once. Who was it brought us together, Bacchus, my dear? What, sir? Oh... You're never... David <laughs> Copperfield. Yes. Give me your hand, Mr. Barkis. Oh. Oh, I'm afraid I can't do that. No power in thy hands, you see. Oh, I'm very sorry to hear that. I'll tell you what. You can shake the tassel from a nightcap instead. <laughs> very well. Oh, thank you, sir. That's as good as shaking hands. Prop me up, Clara. Oh. That's right. Oh, my dear. Well, I never... I feel as if I were driving you on the old Blanderston Road again. <laughs> that has done me good to see you. <laughs> so I'll have. Oh, what name was it as I rode up on the car, sir? <laughs> oh, Mr. Barkis, we had some grave talks about that, didn't we? Always willing. A long time, sir. A long time. And I don't regret it. Oh, Barkis, my dear. Do you remember what you told me once? About her making all the apple pasties and... Doing all the cooking? Yes, very well. <laughs> that were as true as turnips is, as true as taxes is, and nothing's truer than that. Oh. A man as poor as I am finds that out when he's laid up. I'm a very poor man, sir. I'm sorry to hear it. A very poor man. Do you see a box under the bed? Yes, I do. That's only old clothes. Oh, I wish that were money, sir. I wish it was indeed. But that ain't. No. She's the best of women, C.P. Barkers is. <laughs> My dear? Yes? You'll get that dinner ready for company, oh, won't you? Please don't trouble. Yes, you will. Won't you, my dear? Of course I will, Davy. I've got a trifle of money about me somewhere. But I'm a little tired. If you and Mr. David will leave me for a short nap, I'll try and... Find it. When I wake. All right, my dear. Come and mask, Davy. Oh. Um, that's his way, Davy. He's got a little nearer than he used to be. And he won't let anybody see where he keeps his money. It hurt him so to get up, but he will do it. Where is the money, then? In that there box under the bed. Oh, who's that now at the door? I think it may be my friend, Mr. Steerforth. No, 
not him as was at school with you. The very same. I happened to meet him in London. Oh, well, we'd better let him in, Davy. It is him. Well, Daisy. Steerforth. This is my old nurse. Good evening, Peggotty. I beg your pardon. I should say Mrs. Barkis. You say whatever you like, sir. Come <laughs> you in. Come you in. <laughs> Master Davis talked so much about you. You look exactly the way he said you did. <laughs> and how was that? Or perhaps I'd better not ask. Don't answer him, Peggotty. It might make him too vain. <laughs> Will you stay for supper, sir? We take it very kindly, Barkis and I. He's upstairs with the rheumatics, but I know that... Then, of that... course, I mustn't stay. Oh, but Master Dave is staying. That to please us both, sir. She means it, Steerforth. Well, in that case... Thank you, sir. Your old room's ready for you, Master Davy. Oh, but I... I told you once. If you went to China and came back, you'd always know as it was ready. But, Peggotty, I've come here with Mr. Steerforth and... You I... must stay here. Of course you must. I'll sleep at the inn. It seems unfriendly to bring you so far and then separate. Daisy, where do you really belong? Uh, well, I... Of course you must stay. And very soon, Steerforth had worked his usual magic, brightening and refreshing the house and the sick room like light and air. By the time we left the house, I do believe Peggotty had a kind of adoration for him. When we had said goodbye to her and set out for the beach... The wind was blowing, and the sea was high. This is a wild kind of place, isn't it? Dismal enough. The sea roars as if it were hungry for us. Is that the boat ahead? That light? Yes. Yes, it is. Odd. I came straight to it. By instinct, I suppose. I can hear them. Stay close to the window, Steerforth. We'll surprise them. Yes, Uncle, this is to be my little boy. <laughs> Emily, is this true? <laughs> that is true, Uncle, if you please. If I please, as if I could be anything else. <laughs> oh, but I'm steadier now, and I've thought better of it, and I'll be as good little wife as I can to him, for he's a dear good fellow. <laughs> then, then, have bless you. Ah, <laughs> bless you, but... Master Davy! That's Master Davy! <laughs> oh, tis! So tis! Emily, look, it's Master Davy! Uh, bless me, sir, aren't you Mr. Steerforth? <laughs> the very same. <laughs> oh, well, welcome to you both. Welcome. And is this little Emily? Well, Davy, I'm <laughs> pleased indeed to see you. Oh, <laughs> that you too, gentlemen? Gentlemen Grode should come to this here roof tonight of all nights is such a thing as never happened before. That's true. Emily, my darling, that, that's Master Davy's friend. That is the gentleman as you heard on. He comes to see you on the brightest night of your uncle's life. Oh, uncle, please hush, hush now. Oh, she's afeard. She know what I'm going to tell. Look after Mrs. Gummidge for a minute. Yes, Colonel. <laughs> come you along, Emily. Come you along, Oh, well, if this ain't the brightest night of my life, I'm a shellfish. <laughs> Boiled too, and more I can't say. <laughs> this, this, this little Emily of ours, well, she ain't my child, sir. I, I never had one, but I couldn't love her more. Do you understand? I quite understand. Well, I know as you do, sir. Thank you. Master Davy, remember what she was. Indeed I can. Yeah, and you may judge for your own self what she is, but neither of you can't know what she has been and will be to my loving heart. Perhaps I can guess at it a little, Mr. Peggotty. Oh, indeed, sir. Now, you sees my nephew Am, as you met, sir, years ago. <laughs> I remember. Ah, now what? Do this here blessed tarpaulin go and do, but he loses that there art of his to our little Emily. As any man would. Well, I counsels him to speak to her, but he's too bashful, big as he is, so I speaks for him. What? Him? says Emily. Him that I've knowed all my life and like so much? Oh, Uncle, I can never have him. So, 
I tells him that, much as I'd like it to be, it warn't to be, and it warn't. Till, all of a sudden, tonight, they creep in together, hand in hand, and Am cries out to me, joyful, that little Emily has said yes! (laughs) (laughs) Am, you are a fortunate man. Ah, I knows that, Master (laughs) Ivy. Congratulations, Ham. Thank you, sir. I I see her grow up, Jan, like a flower. I lie down my life for her. The hint of gentlemen in all the land, not yet sailing on the sea, that can love his lady more than, more than I love her. Mr. Peggotty, you're a thoroughly good fellow and deserve to be as happy as you are tonight. Ham, I give you joy, my boy. And I have a bottle of Hollands here. We can drink your health. Daisy, stir the fire and make it a brisk one. <laughs> and Mr. Peggotty, unless you can induce your gentle niece to come back, I shall go. Right, sir. I wouldn't make such a gap at your fireside for all the wealth of the Indies. Mother, come you back in here with that lamely. Come along, Amley. Only to be sure you were dear. You, you, you sit here, Amley. <laughs> sit here, my pretty. Say. Master Davies bought his friend to meet us all. Him as you heard so much on. <laughs> Good evening, sir. Good evening, Miss Emily. I know I'm a stranger, but will you let me wish you happiness? I've heard so much of you from David, I feel I know you well. I met your uncle and Ham years ago, you know, while I was still at school. Oh, I know. They often speak of you. I see now all David said was true. And I drink your health tonight. Thank you, sir. And I wish you joy. Steerforth brought Emily and all of us into a charmed circle, and it became the happiest of evenings. He told us a merry adventure with so much gaiety that Emily laughed until the boat rang with a musical sound. Oh, bless us, sir. I'm sure that could never be. I swear it, Emily. It's as true as I'm here beside you. Oh, that's a tale now. Come, Mr. Peggotty. I'll warrant you know a good shanty. Oh, I stormy winds do blow. Oh, stormy winds. Oh, yes. Ah, well then. <coughs> oh, the stormy winds did blow. Did blow. And the raging <laughs> seas did roar. <laughs> and we jolly sailor boys were up <laughs> and up the love. And the landlord's lying down below, below, below. And the landlord's lying down below. (laughs) 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 And now, young lady, what will you see? Oh, bless you, sir. She won't for the life of her. Do you know early one morning? It's a pretty air. I, that I do, sir. Come on, my dear. Early one morning, just as the sun was rising, I heard a maiden sing in the valley below. Oh, don't deceive me. Oh, Oh, never never leave me. How How could you lose a poor maiden? It was almost midnight when we took our leave. We parted merrily, and they all stood crowded round the door to light us as far as they could upon our road. Good night, Master Davy. Good night, sir. Good night. Good night. Go careful now. It is very dark. Goodbye. A most engaging little beauty. (laughs) Well... It's a quaint place, and they're quaint company. It's a new sensation to mix with them. Wasn't it fortunate that we arrived tonight, of all nights? I never saw people so happy. That's rather a chuckle-headed fellow for the girl, isn't he? What? (laughs) A rough diamond would sound better, perhaps. (laughs) Steerforth, when I see how well you understand these friends of mine, how you enter into their happiness as you did tonight, How you feel for them in their troubles, well, it makes me love you twenty times more. Daisy, I believe you're in earnest and are good. I wish we all were. 
<clears throat> Come on, it's late. <laughs> and we jolly sailor boys were up, were up aloft. And the land lovers lying down below, below, below. And the land lovers lying down below. We stopped in Yarmouth more than a fortnight. Some of the time we were separated. Steerforth was a good sailor and I was not. So when he went out in the boat with Mr. Peggotty, I usually stayed ashore. On our last day, I paid a visit to Blunderstone to see our old house. I came back by ferry late in the evening. There was a light in Mr. Peggotty's boat, so I called in. I was surprised to find Steerforth there alone, sitting by the fire. Steerforth? What? Daisy, you come upon me like a reproachful ghost. Have I called you down from the stars? No. I was looking at the pictures in the fire. But don't disturb them. You're spoiling them for me. Ah, but you wouldn't have seen them. I detest this mongrel time, neither day nor night. David, I wish to God I'd had a wise father these last twenty years. Steerforth, what's the matter? I wish with all my soul I'd been better guided. I wish with all my soul I could guide myself better. I've been in torment for the last hour. Tell me what's happened. Let me help you. <laughs> it's nothing. I'm bad company for myself sometimes. What old women call the horrors have been creeping over me. I've been afraid of myself. You're afraid of nothing else. Perhaps not. And yet that may be enough too. Oh, good evening, sir. Evening, Master David. Why, Mrs. Gummidge? I thought some enchanter had come here and spirited everyone away. <laughs> Where is everyone? Well. Daniel's out fishing still. Ham and Emily aren't home from work, and I've been to the market for the supper. There's plenty for all young gentlemen. Would you stay? No, 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 thank you, Mrs. Gummidge. Mr. Steerforth and I are dining at the hotel tonight. <laughs> Give me a kiss, Mrs. Gummidge, and tell me I'm forgiven for taking him away. Oh, sir. <laughs> good night. Oh, good night, gentlemen both. Good night, Mrs. Gummidge. Good night. So, we abandon this buccaneer life tomorrow, do we? Yes. Our places on the coach are taken. Aye. There's no help for it, I suppose. You know I've bought a boat down here. What? You are an extraordinary fellow. Why, you may never come near Yarmouth again. <laughs> I don't know about that. I've taken a fancy to the place. I've bought a clipper. And Mr. Peggotty will be master of it in my absence. Ah, oh, now I understand. You've really done it for him. How generous you are. Oh, nonsense. The least said the better. She must be newly rigged, so I'll leave Littimer behind to see to it. Did I tell you he had come down? No. Oh, yes. He's the same as ever. Distant and quiet as the North Pole. <laughs> he came down with a letter from my mother. He shall see to the boat being renamed. She's the Stormy Petrel now. <laughs> what does Mr. Peggotty care for stormy petrol? <laughs> I'll have her rechristened. By what name? The Little Emily, I think. Look, isn't that our own Little Emily? And her true knight with her as Did all. They, carry that the it is. Right? they haven't seen us. Emily! No. Let them be. What is that? Following them. It's. A woman, I, I don't know her. It's an ill omen black shadow, whatever it may be. A poor lost soul, by the look of her. Perhaps she means to beg from them. Perhaps. A beggar would be no novelty. But it's a strange thing the beggar should take that form tonight. Why? Because I was thinking of something like it when it appeared. <laughs> it's gone now. And all ill go with it. And now, for dinner, before you go back to the care of your nurse. <laughs> <laughs> we had dinner together, and then I left him, and went back to Peggotty and my own little room. The quiet street was empty, or nearly so. A solitary man was walking up and down before the house. I was surprised to see 
that it was Ham. Oh, good evening, Master Davey. Ham, why are you waiting here? Well, sir, you see, Ham is talking to someone in there. <laughs> then why aren't you in there too? Oh, I ain't a general way I would be, but that's a young woman, a young woman as Emily knowed once and did not know no more. Who is she? Our poor soul as is trod underfoot by all the town. The mould in the churchyard don't hold any that the folks shrink away from more. I think I saw her early this evening, following you. Following me? Where? On the beach. You were with Emily and there was this figure. You didn't see us, so we did not disturb you. Ah... That's like your dad say her then. Not that I knew she was there, but she crept under Emily's window soon afterwards and caught her. Who is she? Martha Andel. Two or three years older than Emily, but uh, she was at the school with her and worked at Omer's too. She caught her. Emily, Emily, for Christ's sake, have a woman's heart towards me. I was once like you. Ah. Uh, those were solemn words to hear, Master Davy. They were indeed. What did Emily do? Oh, Emily couldn't speak to her then. For a loving uncle was come home. And kind-hearted as he is, he couldn't see them two together for all the treasure of the sea. I see. No, I'm sure that's true. So, Emily write on a bit of paper and give it to Martha out the window to bring here to show her aunt. Then she tell me and ask me to bring her hair. I see. Oh, Master Davy, what can I do? She don't ought to know any such. But I can't deny her when the tears are on her face. Oh, it's, it's that little purse. She gave it to me, such as a tie as it is, to look after. I know why she's by it. Come you in now, Han. Oh, Master Davy. I I'll go away. Uh... No, no, do you come in too? Well, Emily? Martha, I want to go to London. Why to London? Better there than here. No one know me there. Everyone know me here. What will she do there? She'll try to do well. You don't know what she said to us, do we, Aunt? No, indeed. I'll try. If you'll help me away. I never can do worse than what I've done here. I may do better. Oh, take me out of these here streets where a whole town know me from a child. Ham, have you got my purse? Ah, that's my lovely. But this is your money. That's all yarn, Emily. I haven't no in all the world that aren't yarn, my dear. There ain't a no delight to me. It's that for you. Martha, is, is this enough? Oh, more than enough. More than enough. God bless you. You don't ought to cry so. Oh, Ham, I'm not so good a girl as I ought to be. I know I have not the thankful heart I ought to have. Oh, you have. I'm sure. No. I'm not as good a girl as I ought to be. Not near. No, I, no. I try your love too much. I'm often cross and changeable to you. You're never so to me. Oh, no, no, I, I should think of nothing but how to make you happy. You always do. <laughs> I'm happy in the sight of you. In the thought of you. Oh, no, but that's not enough. That's because you're good, not because I am. Oh, my dear. It might have been better for you if you'd been fond of someone else. Of someone worthier than me. Oh, poor little soft heart. Martha's overset her heart together. Oh, try to help me. Ham, dear, try to help me. I want to be a better girl than I am. I want to feel more what a blessed thing it is to be the wife of a good man and to lead a peaceful life. <laughs> Oh, hush, my dear. Oh, hush. Oh. Oh, Ham. D. 
dear. Bless you. All our friends took leave of us the following morning and seemed very sorry to see us go. Goodbye, my precious. Bye, Goodbye, Peggy. Bye, Mistress Tearful, sir. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Goodbye. Goodbye. Why isn't it a mistake? Oh, he has some business of mine to attend to, and he'll stay until he's done it. Now, you said you had something you wanted to ask me once we were alone. What was it? I had a letter this morning from my aunt. She asks if I'd like to be a proctor. I'm afraid to confess that I don't even know what a proctor is. <laughs> a proctor is a sort of monkish attorney. He is in Doctors' Commons what solicitors are to courts of law. Are proctors and advocates the same thing? No, the proctors employed the advocates and both get very comfortable fees. So I advise you to take kindly to Doctors' Commons, Daisy. When will you see your aunt? When I get to London. She's staying in Lincoln's Inn Fields. Trotwood. My dear Trotwood. I'm sure if your poor mother had been alive, her silly little creature would have shed tears. <laughs> dear Aunt Betsy. I've missed you. Oh. <laughs> what have you done with Mr. Dick? Is he in London too? No. I've left him behind, and I'm sorry for it. Why? Because I'm convinced Mr. Dick's character is not a character to keep the donkeys off. <laughs> I've brought Janet up with me and left him behind, and I should have done it the other way round. This afternoon, at four o'clock, a cold feeling came over me from head to foot. If ever there was a donkey on my green, there was one then. I'm sure there was. No, no, it was a donkey. It was the one with the stumpy tail that murdering sister of a woman rode. If there's any donkey in the world whose impudence I find harder to bear than the others, it's that donkey. <laughs> but it's too late to worry. Trot, what do you think of the Proctor plan? I like it, Aunt. I like it very much. Ah, that's cheering. There's only one difficulty. Hmm? What is it? How much will it cost? Oh, to article you? Just a thousand pounds. That's a large sum of money. Oh. You've spent a lot of my education and you've always been very generous. Surely there are some ways I can begin in life with less outlay. Are you certain you can afford this? Trot, my child. If I have any object in life, it's to provide for your being a good, sensible, happy man. Perhaps I might have been better friends with your poor father. Or even with that poor child, your mother. After your sister, Betsy Trotwood, disappointed me. When you came to me, a little runaway boy, all dusty and wayworn, perhaps I thought so too. From that time till now, you've always been a credit to me and a pride and a pleasure. Aunt Betsy, I wish I deserved that. You do, Tot. You do. I have no other claim on my means. At least I... No, I have no other claim on my means. And you are my adopted child. Only be a loving child to me in my age and bear with my whims and fancies and you will do more for an old woman whose prime of life wasn't so happy as it might have been than that old woman ever did for you. Next day, we set out for the office of Messrs. Spenlow and Jorkins in Doctors' Commons. My aunt was of the general opinion that every man she saw in London was a pickpocket, so she gave me her purse to carry which had ten guineas in it and some silver. We were on Ludgate Hill when my aunt suddenly quickened her step and looked frightened. I saw that an ill-dressed man who had stared at us in passing was now following us closely. Trot, my dear Trot, I don't know what to do. Is it that man? Uh, it is, isn't it? There's nothing to be afraid of. Go into a shop and I'll get rid of him. No, don't speak to him. I order you. Good heavens! He's only a sturdy beggar. You don't know what he is. You don't know who he is. Don't look at him. Get me a coach and wait for me in St. Paul's Churchyard. Quickly now. And my purse, if you please. May I not come with you? No. I must go alone. I must go with him. With him? That fellow? Yes, I must. Get me a coach, Trotwood, please. Coachman! Get in. Coachman, drive anywhere. Drive straight on. Oh. 
I waited in the churchyard for half an hour before I saw the coach coming back. The driver stopped beside me, and I saw my aunt was now alone. Aunt Betsy, are you all right? Yes, yes. Get in, Trot. Has he gone? Yes, my dear child. I want you to promise me something. Of course, anything. Promise me that you will never ask me who he was. Oh, but never I... ask me who he was. Never refer to it again. But when Aunt Betsy gave me her purse to pay the driver, I saw that only the silver remained. All the guineas were gone. Officers of Spenlow and Jorkins in Doctor's Commons were old-fashioned and dusty. Mister Spenlow himself was a little light-haired gentleman, buttoned up mighty trim and tight, with undeniable boots and accurately curled whiskers. Ah, Mister Spenlow, this is my nephew. Ah, good morning, Mister Copperfield. Good morning, sir. So you think of entering into our profession? Miss Trotwood was good enough to tell me that she had a nephew for whom she was seeking to provide in life. Yes, sir. I think I'd very much like to take advantage of the opportunity, but I can't absolutely pledge myself until I know a little more about it. Oh, surely, surely. We always propose an initiatory month. I, I should be happy myself to make it an indefinite period, but I have a partner, uh, Mister Jorkins. Ah,、oh. and the premium is. A thousand pounds, stamp included. A thousand pounds. I myself am influenced by no mercenary considerations, but Mr. Jorkins has his opinions, which I am bound to respect.、Uh, Mr. Jorkins thinks a thousand pounds too little. I suppose, sir, if an article clerk were particularly useful, it isn't the custom in later years of his time to, well, to allow him any salary. Quite. No. Would say that I might not consider that point if I were unfettered, but Mister Jorkins is quite immovable. Ah!、Oh. I was dismayed by the idea of this terrible Jorkins, but it was settled that I should begin my month's probation as soon as I pleased. My aunt was now free to return to Canterbury, but she wanted to install me in suitable lodgings first. A sweet set of chambers they are, ma'am, for such a young gentleman as your nephew. <laughs> This way's the sitting room. <laughs> ah, is this the last occupant's furniture, Mrs. Crump? Yes, it is, ma'am. What's become of him? He he was took ill, ma'am, and he died. Eh? What did he die of? He died of drink, ma'am, and smoke. Smoke? Do you mean chimneys? Oh no, ma'am. Cigars and pipes. Ah,、oh, well, that's not catching trot at any rate. Ah, it's near the fire escape. Good. What do you think, Trotwood? I, I like it. Two days later, I took up residence. I was delighted with my new independence. Why, Daisy! What a rare old bachelor you are here. Stare for. <laughs> I tell you what, I shall make quite a town house of this place unless you give me notice to quit. <laughs> If you wait for that, you wait till doomsday. <laughs> Where have you been? I was beginning to think I'd never see you again. I was carried off by force of arms the very morning I got home. Some friends of mine from Oxford—they're up in town now. We're all three off together tomorrow morning. Then bring them both to dinner tonight. What? Oh no, Daisy, you come and dine with us somewhere. Steer forth. Please give me the pleasure of playing host for the first time. I really should have a housewarming. <laughs> well, if you put it like that. All right. What time? Six o'clock. Now, Mister Copperfull, as you know well, I can't be expected to wait at table. No, Missus Crupp, of course not. But I thought you might know someone. There's a handy young man as might be prevailed upon to do it if so be as you agreed to five shillings. Yes, we'll certainly have him. 
And I can't be in two places at once, Mr Copperfull, so you need a young gal in a pantry to wash plates. And what would that cost? I suppose as 18 pence would not a make no break you. 18 pence? Very well. Now, nah, about a dinner. Chops and mashed potatoes is all as my kitchen can do you. Oh. What about fish? A fish kittle? You come and look at my range, Mr Copperfull. I can't say fairer than that. Well, then, never mind fish. Oysters is in. Why not oysters? Oysters would be excellent. I'll tell you what else I'd recommend, sir. A pair of hot roast fowls but I thought from the said... pastry cooks, a dish of stewed beef and vegetables from the pastry cooks, two little corner things as a raised pie and a dish of kidneys. From the pastry cooks? That's right, sir. Then a tart and a shape of jelly from the pastry cooks. And that'll leave me at liberty to concentrate my mind on the potatoes and to serve the cheese and celery as I could wish to see it done. I gave instructions to the pastry cooks myself and put in an extensive order to a wine merchant in Covent Garden. The dinner went quite well. Steerforth exerted himself brilliantly and I soon recovered from my first shyness. There were, however... A few unexpected difficulties. <laughs> Good heavens, Copperfield. That's the fifth time. You won't have a plate left fit to eat off. It's the young girl. Mrs. Crop recommended her. But do you know, I don't think she's ever waited at table before. <laughs> I began being singularly cheerful and light-hearted and passing the wine faster and faster. That was to prove my first mistake. More wine, Steerforth? <laughs> oh, that's the end of the bottle. Open another, will you? Delighted, Daisy. <laughs> Granger, your glass. Thank you, Copperfield. Ah, gentlemen, raise your glasses. I wish to propose a toast. <clears throat> Steerforth is my dearest friend, the protector of my boyhood, the companion of my prime. <laughs> I owe him more than I can ever repay. I admire him more than I can express. I give you Steerforth. God bless him. <laughs> Steerforth. God bless him. <laughs> Steerforth, you're the guiding star of my existence. Now, gentlemen, I will give a toast to woman. No. No. That's not respectful. To the ladies. A man isn't to be dictated to like that, Copperfield. Yes, a man is. A man isn't to be insulted. No. No, you're right. Never under my roof. The laws of hospitality are sacred. <laughs> you're a dash good fellow, Copperfield. <laughs> Your health. <laughs> to Copperfield. Copperfield. <laughs> Copperfield. Have a cigar. Thank you. I will. That was my second mistake. Oh, Copperfield. Why did you try to smoke? You should have known you couldn't do it. Daisy? Yes? We're going to the theatre. Are you coming? Good idea. And that was my last and worst mistake. Please excuse me. Oh, oh. Oh, don't forgive me. <laughs> Trotwood! Trotwood! Agnes! Lord bless me! Agnes! Trotwood, go home. Agnes, aren't you well? Listen to me. Go away now, for my sake. Ask your friends to take you home. Agnes, why? Please, for my sake. I was angry with her, but I did as she asked. Somehow or other, I stepped straight out of the theatre into my bedroom, where Steerforth was helping me to undress and discouraging me from opening another bottle of wine. There we are, Daisy. Uh, I'll put your coat on the chair. What? What's the matter with my tie? <laughs> Confoundedly obstinate, isn't it? <laughs> Allow me. Oh, thanks. Let's open another bottle. Uh, another time, my friend. Oh. Another time. Oh. Mm. Perhaps you shouldn't go to bed with your shoes on. 
Oh, what an agony that night was. The bed was a rocking sea. My mouth was parched, my tongue the bottom of an empty kettle, furred and burnt, and my hands hot plates of metal. But that was nothing to the shame I felt next day. What had I done? What had I said? I couldn't remember. All I knew was that Agnes had been there and had seen me. The room was full of dirty glasses and smelt of smoke, and Mrs. Crupp, no doubt with the best intentions, brought me a basin of mutton broth, dimpled all over with fat. Oh, I made it specially, sir. Thank you, Mrs. Crupp. Put it on the side table. Oh, you should take it out, sir. And there's a letter. Come by end. A letter? Oh, yes. Thank you. My dear Trotwood. My dear Trotwood, I am staying at the house of Papa's agent, Mr. Waterbrook, Ely Place, Hoban. Will you come and see me tomorrow at any time you care to appoint? Ever yours affectionately, Agnes. Oh. Well, is there any answer, sir? The man has brought his weight in downstairs. Uh, tell him... Tell him to say I'll call at four o'clock tomorrow. Trotwood! Oh, Agnes, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I almost wish I were dead. Oh, goodness, Trotwood, don't be so unhappy. But you're not angry? No. Oh, Agnes, you're my good angel. Always my good angel. If I really were, there's one thing I'd set my heart on. What's that? On warning you against your bad angel. If you mean Steerforth... I do. Then you do him wrong. He's no one's bad angel. He's my guide, my support, and my friend. It's unjust and unlike you to judge him by what you saw of me the other night. I don't judge him by that. By what, then? I judge him from your account of him, from your character, and the influence he has over you. I'm sure I'm right. I feel as if it was someone else speaking to you, not I, when I warn you that you've made a dangerous friend. No, Agnes, I can't... I don't expect you to agree with me now. I only ask you to think of what I've said. Do you forgive me for saying this? I'll forgive you when you come to do Steerforth justice and like him as much as I do. But when will you forgive me the other night? Oh, when I remember it. Have you seen Uriah? No. Is he in London? He comes to the office downstairs every day. I'm afraid he's here on disagreeable business. Oh? What is it? I think he's going to enter into partnership with Papa. What? Uriah? Agnes, you must prevent it. Papa hinted at it soon after we last saw you. He tried to pretend it was his choice, but he couldn't hide the truth. It was forced upon him. By whom? By Uriah. He's made himself indispensable. He's watched Papa's weaknesses, fostered them and taken advantage of them. Now Papa's afraid of him. He professes humility and gratitude, maybe sincerely, but his position is really one of power, and he makes hard use of it. The man is a hound! He threatened to leave, and Papa was alarmed. He relies so much on Uriah now. This expedient of the partnership seemed to relieve Papa, even though he was ashamed of it. And what did you say when your father spoke to you? What I hope was right. I felt this was necessary for his peace, even though it was a sacrifice. So, I told him to agree to it. Oh, Trotwood... I almost feel I've been Papa's enemy instead of his loving child. Because of his devotion to me, he's narrowed his life, his sympathies and his duties. However innocently, I've been responsible for his decline. I'd do anything, anything, if only I could set this right. Oh, you Uriah, that mean, fawning fellow, I'd, I'd like to... Trotwood, please... For my sake, don't antagonise him. Think first of Papa and of me, and be friendly to him. Friendly? For my sake. <sighs> very well. But it will come hard. How hard, I discovered very soon. Mrs Waterbrook, a large lady who had unfortunately seen my arrival at the theatre, came into the room and stopped our conversation. Once she discovered I was, on this occasion, a sober and reasonably well-conducted young gentleman, she invited me to dinner the next day. I should be delighted to see you, Mr Copperfield. We dine at seven. Uriah was there, in a suit of black, and in deep humility. 
Mr. Copperfield, <coughs> how proud I am to be noticed by you. I hope I see you well. Very well, thank you, you are. And are you? Mr. Traddles. Mr. Traddles, I'm so glad you could join us tonight. Thank you, Mrs. Waterbrook. It's very kind of you to invite me. What? I beg your pardon, Master Copperfield? That gentleman who's just come in. I think I know him. Forgive me. Mr. Waterbrook. Sir. I think I have the pleasure of seeing an old schoolfellow here. Indeed. Mr. Traddles. Oh, Traddles. Possibly. Traddles is a good fellow. He's reading for the bar. Uh, Mr. Traddles. Uh, yes, sir. This uh, gentleman thinks you're previously acquainted. Indeed? I'm afraid I don't... Salem House, Traddles. Don't you remember me? Well, upon my soul... Copperfield! <laughs> I couldn't be more pleased! <laughs> Nor could I! <laughs> Dinner is served. Uh, Traddles, huh? one moment. Here's my address. Oh, the Adelphi. How splendid, Copperfield. Oh, uh, mine isn't at all splendid, I'm afraid, but uh, here it is. We must meet. I want to know what you've been doing since you left Salem House. Indeed. We will. We will. <laughs> at the close of the evening, I found myself leaving the house in company with Uriah. Remembering Agnes's request, I asked him if he'd come to my rooms for coffee. And after writhing a little in abject appreciation of the honour I'd done him, he accepted. <gasps> Master Copperfield, I beg your pardon, Mr. Copperfield, but the other comes so natural. To see you waiting on me is what I never could have expected. One way and another, so many things happen to me which I never could have expected. I am sure in my humble station that it seems to rain blessings on my head. <laughs> you have heard something, I dare say, of a change in my expectations, Master Copperfield. I should say, Mr. Copperfield. Yes, something. I thought Miss Agnes would know of it. I'm glad to find Miss Agnes knows of it. Oh, thank you, Master, Mr. Copperfield. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you remember saying to me once that perhaps I should be a partner in Mr. Wickfield's business and perhaps it might be Wickfield and Heap? You may not recollect it, but when a person is humble, Master Copperfield, a person treasures such things up. I remember talking about it, though I certainly didn't think it very likely. Oh, who would have thought it likely, Mr. Copperfield? I'm sure I did it myself. I recollect saying with my own lips that I was much too humble. But the humblest persons may be the instruments of good. I'm glad to think I've been the instrument of good to Mr. Wickfield. Oh, what a worthy man he is. But how imprudent he's been. I'm sorry to hear it. On all accounts. Decidedly so, Mr. Copperfield, on all accounts. Miss Agnes is above all. I remember how you said one day that everybody must admire her and how I thank you for it. You have forgot that, I have no doubt, Master Copperfield. No. Oh, how glad I am you haven't. To think that you should be the first to kindle the sparks of ambition in my humble breast and that you've not forgot it. Oh, would you excuse me asking for a cup more coffee? Of course. So... Mr. Whitfield, who's worth 500 of you, or me, has been imprudent, has he, Mr. Heap? Oh, very imprudent indeed, Mr. Copperfield. Oh, very much so. But I wish you'd call me Uriah, if you please. Like old times. Well, Uriah. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Master Copperfield. It's like the blowing of old breezes or the ringing of old bellsies to hear you say, Uriah. I beg your pardon? Was I making any observation? About Mr Wickfield? Oh, yes, truly. Great imprudence, Master Copperfield. It's a topic I wouldn't touch on to any soul but you. Even to you, I can only touch upon it and no more. If anyone else had been in my place during the last few years... By this time, he would have had Mr. Wickfield, oh, what a worthy man he is, Master Copperfield, too, under his thumb. Under his thumb. Oh, yes, there would have been loss, disgrace, 
I don't know what. Mr. Whitfield knows that. I am the humble instrument of humbly serving him, and he puts me on an eminence I could hardly have hoped to reach. How thankful I should be. But am I keeping you up? Uh, no, I generally go to bed late. Thank you, Master Copperfield. I have risen from my humble station since we first met. But I am humble still. I never shall be otherwise than humble. You won't think the worse of my humbleness if I make a little confidence to you, Master Copperfield? No, no. Thank you. Miss Agnes, Master Copperfield. Well, you're right. Oh, how pleasant to be called Uriah spontaneously. <laughs> she looked very beautiful tonight, didn't she, Master Copperfield? She looked as she always does. Superior to everyone round her. Oh, thank you. It's so true. Thank you very much for that. Not at all. There's no reason why you should thank me. Humble as I am, humble as my mother is, and lowly as our poor but honest Ruth has ever been, the image of Miss Agnes has been in my breast for years. I don't mind trusting you with my secret, Master Copperfield, for I've always overflowed towards you since the first moment I had the pleasure of beholding you in a pony show. Oh, with what a pure affection do I love the ground my Agnes walks on. Indeed. Have you... Have you made your feelings known to Miss Wickfield? Oh, no, Master Copperfield. Oh, dear, no. Not to anyone but you. You see, I'm only just emerging from my lowly station. I rest a good deal of hope on her observing how useful I am to her father and how I smooth the way for him and keep him straight. She's so much attached to her father. Oh, what a lovely thing that is in a daughter. <laughs> and I think she may come on his account to be kind to me. I take it as a particular favour, Master Copperfield, if you'll have the goodness to keep my secret and not, in general, go against me. Dear me, it's quite one o'clock. The moments slip away so, remembering old times. I thought it was much later. Master Copperfield, the house I'm stopping at, a sort of a private hotel, We'll have gone to bed these two hours. I'm sorry, there's only one bed here. Oh, don't think of mentioning beds, Master Copperfield. But would you have any objections to me laying down before the fire? If it comes to that, you can take my bed and I'll lie down before the fire. <laughs> oh, no! Mr Copperfield, I couldn't allow that. It wouldn't be right at all, no. If I might be allowed the privilege of a sofa cushion or two and a blanket. Anything else would not be proper for someone as humble as myself. I gave him the mattress from the sofa. I gave him a blanket. I lent him a nightcap, in which he made such an awful figure that I've never worn one since. And I left him to his rest. But I had little rest that night. Two voices haunted me. I've been Papa's enemy instead of his loving child. I've been responsible for his decline. I'd do anything, anything, if only I could set this right. I rest a good deal of hope on her observing how useful I am to her father and how I smooth the way for him and keep him straight. She's so much attached to her father. I think she may come, on his account, to be kind to me. I'd do anything, anything, if only I could set this right. Anything? Oh, no. Surely not that. When Uriah went away in the morning, I opened the windows wide that my sitting room might be purged of his presence. But my mind was not free of him. I could not forget what he had said. The fear that Agnes might sacrifice herself tormented me for many weeks. It was the dominant thing in my mind, until I was asked to stay for the weekend at Mr. Spenlow's house. And something momentous happened to me. Uh, Mr. Copperfield, uh, this is my daughter, Dora. How do you do, Mr. Copperfield? 
How, how do you do, Miss Benlow? I had fulfilled my destiny. I was a captive and a slave, and I loved Dora Spenlow to distraction. And this is my daughter Dora's confidential friend. I have seen Mr. Copperfield before. Miss Murdstone? Yes, Mr. Copperfield. How do you do? I hope you're well. Very well. How is Mr. Murdstone? My brother is robust. I am obliged to you. I'm glad to find, Copperfield, that you and Miss Murdstone are already acquainted. Mr. Copperfield and myself are connections. We were once slightly acquainted in his childish days. Circumstances have separated us since. I should not have known him. I would have known you anywhere, Miss Murdstone. Uh, Miss Murdstone has had the goodness to accept the office, if I may so describe it, of my daughter Dora's confidential friend. My daughter Dora having unhappily no mother, Miss Murdstone is obliging enough to become her companion and protector. It occurred to me that Miss Murdstone was not so much designed for protection as for assault. I was very much afraid that she might disparage me to Dora, but after dinner, she drew me aside. David Copperfield, I need not enlarge upon family circumstances. They are not a tempting subject. Far from it, ma'am, indeed. Far from it. I do not wish to revive the memory of past differences or of past outrages which I have received from a person, a female, I am sorry to say, for the credit of my sex, who isn't to be mentioned without scorn and disgust. Therefore, I won't mention her. It would certainly be better if you didn't. I couldn't allow her to be mentioned disrespectfully before me. David Copperfield, I won't disguise the fact that I formed an unfavorable opinion of you in your childhood. It may have been mistaken, or you may have ceased to justify it. That is not in question between us now. I may have my opinion of you, you may have your opinion of me, but it isn't necessary that those opinions should come into collision here. It's as well on all counts that they should not. Let us meet here as distant acquaintances. That was quite charming, my dear. I believe now it is quite unnecessary for either of us to make the other the subject of remark. Do you approve of this? Miss Murdstone, I think you and Mr. Murdstone used me very cruelly and treated my mother with great unkindness. I shall always think so as long as I live. But I quite agree in what you propose. Miss Benlow, pray sing that song again. Very well. For the rest of the evening, I was lost in a blissful delirium. Dora sang, Dora smiled, Dora dimpled. And before she left us, she gave me her delicious hand for a moment. I retired to bed in a most maudlin state of mind. It was a fine morning and early when I woke, so I went for a walk in the garden. I turned a corner, and there she was. Oh, good morning, Miss Benlow. Good morning, Mr. Copperfield. You are out early? It's the brightest time in the whole day. Don't you think so? <laughs> it was dark for me a minute ago, but, but now... It's very bright indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Do you mean a compliment? Oh, No, not a compliment. It's the truth. The weather hasn't changed. It's the state of my feelings. <laughs> Mr. Spenlow tells me that you've just come home from Paris. Yes, I was at school there. Have you ever been to Paris? No. Oh, I hope you'll go soon. You'd like it so much. But I would hate to leave England... Now that I've met you, Miss Spenlow. Mr. Copperfield! <laughs> Chip, dear, come here. There. Hello, Chip. <laughs> Chip, you naughty boy. You're not very intimate with Miss Murdstone, are you, Mr. Copperfield? No, not at all. She's a tiresome creature. Who wants a protector? I'm sure I don't. Jip can protect me a great deal better than Miss Murdstone, can't you, Jip, dear? <laughs> we don't want a sulky, gloomy old thing like her always following us about, do we, Jip? Come, a kiss for you. 
Oh, fortunate Jip. We strolled to the greenhouse and looked at Mr. Spenlow's geraniums. Jip, you dearest thing. See this pretty flower? Don't eat it. No. To this day, the scent of a geranium leaf brings me the vision of a straw hat, blue ribbons, and a quantity of curls. And a little black dog being held up in two slender arms to smell the flowers. During the next weeks, I walked mile upon mile in the hope of seeing her. As I'd recklessly purchased a pair of boots too small for me, in addition to kid gloves and four superior waistcoats, this activity nearly crippled me. I was always looking for another invitation to Mr. Spenlow's house, but I got none. <laughs> Mr. Copperfull, could you oblige me with a little tincture of cardamoms mixed with rhubarb with seven drops of essence of cloves? It's to settle my stomach. I'm afraid I've... If I... you've not such a thing by you, a little brandy is the next best thing. It's not so palatable to me, but it's the next best. Uh, I, I have brandy. Here you are, Mrs. Crop. Oh, oh, let me pour it, sir. I know just how little to take for it. Oh, thank you, sir. <gasps> Cheer up, Mr. Copperfull. I can't bear to see you so. I'm a mother myself. I know what it is. What it is? There's a lady in a case. Mrs. Crow. Oh, keep a good heart, sir. Never say die. If she don't smile on you, there's many as will. You're a young gentleman to be smiled on, and you must learn your value, sir. What makes you suppose there's any young lady in the case? Oh, sir, a young gentleman may be over-careful of himself, or he may be under-careful of himself. He may brush his hair too regular. Or too unregular. He may wear his boots too large for him or too small. Uh. But let him go to which extreme he may. There's a young lady in both of them. The gentleman which died here before yourself fell in love with a barmaid and had his waistcoats taken directly. Though much swelled with drinking. Mrs. Crop, please don't connect the young lady in my case. With a barmaid? Mr. Copperfull, I'm a mother myself, and not likely. I think I'll take a few drops more. I ask your pardon if I intrude, but my advice to you is to cheer up and to know your own value. If you was to take to something, sir, if you was to... Take to skittles, which is healthy. You might find it divert your mind and do you good. Thank you for them few drops, sir. Mrs. Crupp then departed, leaving me with an empty brandy bottle. It may have been in consequence of her advice that it came into my head the next day to call upon Traddles at his address in Camden Town. Traddles, <laughs> my dear fellow. Oh, Copperfield, I'm very glad indeed to see you. <laughs> it was because I was thoroughly glad to see you when we met and was sure you were thoroughly glad to see me that I gave you this address instead of my address at Chambers. Oh, you have Chambers? Oh, uh, three others and myself unite to have a set of Chambers. Why, I have the fourth of a room and a passage and the fourth of a clerk. <laughs> I don't usually give this address because some people might not like to come here. It isn't because I have the least pride. I'm fighting my way on in the world against difficulties and it would be ridiculous if I pretended I was doing anything else. Mr. Waterbrook told me you were reading for the bar. Why, yes. It's some time since I was articled, though. That hundred pounds was a great pull. I remember you so well at school. <laughs> in that... That sky blue suit you used to wear. Oh, Lord, so I did. <laughs> Those were happy times. <laughs> do you remember our suppers in the dormitory? And do you remember when I got Cain for crying about Mr. Mel? Yes. <laughs> Old Creakle. Oh, I'd like to see him again, too. But he was a brute to you, was he? Well, perhaps he was, rather. But it's all over long ago. Weren't you brought up by an uncle? I, I seem to remember Yes, that... I, I was. He made me his heir, but he didn't like me when I grew up. He said I wasn't at all what he expected. And so he married his housekeeper. What did you do? I didn't do anything. 
Then he died, and she married a young man, and so I wasn't provided for. Did you get nothing? I got fifty pounds. I entered myself as a law student, and that ran away with most of it. But little by little, and not living high, I managed to scrape up a hundred pounds at last. Though it certainly was a pull. <laughs> well done, Traddles. Now, Copperfield, you're so exactly what you used to be, with that agreeable face, <laughs> that I shan't conceal anything. I am engaged. Engaged? <laughs> Why? I congratulate you. She's a curate's daughter, one of ten in Devonshire. She's the dearest girl. <laughs> I dare say ours is likely to be a long engagement, but we always say wait and hope. She'd wait, Copperfield, till she was sixty or any age for me. Oh. In the meantime, I get on as well as I can. In general, I board with the people downstairs who are excellent company. <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Micawber have seen a great deal Mr. of life. Mr. and Mrs. Micawber. Yes. I know them well. Good heavens. Do you really? <laughs> oh, ah. I beg your pardon, Mr. Traddles. <laughs> I was not aware that there was any individual alien to this tenement in your sanctum. How do you do, Mr. McCorber? <laughs> Sir, you are exceedingly obliging. I am in status quo. And Mrs. McCorber? She is also, thank God, in status quo. And the children? I rejoice that they are likewise. <laughs> oh, but is it possible? <laughs> Have I the pleasure of again beholding Copperfield? <laughs> you have! My old acquaintance, welcome! <laughs> oh, my dear, here is a gentleman in Mr. Traddles' apartment whom I wish to have the pleasure of presenting to you. <laughs> Good heavens, Mr. Traddles, to think that I should find you acquainted with a friend of my youth, <laughs> the companion of earlier days. <laughs> Mrs. Micawber is, I rejoice to say, once again in an interesting, though delicate, state of health. My dear, here is a gentleman of the name of Copperfield who wished to renew his acquaintance with Why, you. Why, Mr. Copperfield? Oh, 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 oh Emma, my oh, dearest. Oh. oh, water, Mr. Traddles, water. Sir. I fear I was too precipitate after such a lapse of time. She soon revived, I'm glad to say. And before I left, I appointed a day on which I should entertain both the Micawbers and Traddles to dinner. In the meantime, I lived on coffee and thoughts of Dora. I was determined not to repeat the extensive preparations of my first disastrous dinner party. I provided a pair of soles, a small leg of mutton and a pigeon pie. At first, Mrs. Crupp refused to have anything to do with them. But finally, we reached a compromise and she agreed to cook on condition that I dined from home for a fortnight afterwards. I laid in the materials for a bowl of punch to be compounded by Mr. Micawber. I laid the cloth with my own hands and awaited the result with composure. My dear Copperfield, this is luxurious. <laughs> this is a way of life which reminds me of the period when I was myself in a state of celibacy and Mrs. Micawber had not yet been solicited to plight her faith at the hymeneal altar. He means solicited by him, Mr. Copperfield. He cannot answer for others. My dear, <laughs> I have no desire to answer for others. I am too well aware that when, in the inscrutable decrees of fate, you were reserved for me, it is possible you may have been reserved for one destined, after a protracted struggle, to fall a victim to pecuniary involvements of a complicated nature. Oh. I understand your illusion, my dear. Oh. I regret it. But I can bear it. Macoba, have I deserved this? I, who never have deserted you, who never will desert you. My love, you will forgive. And our old and tried friend Copperfield will, I am sure, forgive. The momentary laceration of a wounded spirit made sensitive by a recent collision with the minion of power. In other words, with a ribald turncock attached to the waterworks. And will pity, not condemn, its excesses. Our domestic water supply is... For the time being, no more. <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that, Mr. Micawber. Come now. I rely on you for a bowl of punch superior to the ordinary. Here are the lemons, and uh, here is the rum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ah. 
A little more rum is required, I think. <laughs> I assure you, Copperfield, I am not in the thrall of the demon, but I am of the opinion that in order that the flavour should be at its finest, a little more rum is required. Uh, and, my love, the juice of another lemon. Oh! Uh -huh. Mr. Copperfield, sir. Your mutton. Uh, uh, thank you, Mrs. Crupp. I'm afraid, uh, I'm afraid something's happened to the mutton. Accidents happen, my dear Copperfield. It appears to have fallen into the ashes. But, but it's not even cooked. If you will allow me to take the liberty of remarking that there are few comestibles better in their way than deviled mutton, I believe we could accomplish a good one if you could produce a gridiron, and this little misfortune could be easily repaired. There was a gridiron in the pantry, on which my morning bacon was cooked. We had it out in a twinkling. Traddles cut the mutton into slices. There you are, Copperfield. Pepper, Mr. Micawber seasoned them. Mustard. Salt, Copperfield, you have cayenne. I put the slices onto the gridiron, turned them with a fork, and took them off under Mr. Micawber's direction, oh, there we are. while Mrs. Micawber heated and continually stirred some mushroom ketchup in a little saucepan. Delicious. When we had slices enough done to begin upon, we fell to. <laughs> oh, a feast one. fit oh, for a king. <laughs> we were at the height of our enjoyment, when I was suddenly aware of a strange presence in the room. Why, Littimer, what's the matter? Uh, I beg your pardon, sir. I was directed to come in. Is my master not here? No. Have you not seen him, sir? No. Does you come from him? Not immediately so, sir. Did he tell you that you'd find him here? Not exactly, sir. But I should think he might be here tomorrow, as he's not been here today. Is he coming up from Oxford? I beg, sir, that you'll be seated and allow me to do this. Thank you, sir. Your mutton, madam? Ah, oh, thank you. Uh, sir? Very good. Very good. Thank you. Sir, what? Oh, uh, no thank you. No more. May I take your plate, sir? Yes. Yes, I think so. Thank you, sir. Would you care for more wine? Uh, Mr. Micawber? Very kind. Uh, can I do anything more, sir? Uh, thank you, no, Littimer. Will you not take some dinner yourself? Uh, none. I am obliged to you, sir. Is Mr. Steerforth coming from Oxford? I should imagine he might be here tomorrow, sir. I rather thought he might have been here today. The mistake is mine, no doubt. Littimer? Sir? Did you stay long at Yarmouth? Not particularly so, sir. You saw the boat completed? Oh, yes, sir. I remained behind on purpose to see the boat completed. I know. Mr. Steerforth hasn't seen it yet, I suppose. I really can't say, sir. I think... Uh, but I really can't say. I wish you good night. Uh, good night. Good night, Littimer. A most respectable fellow. A thoroughly admirable servant. But Punch, my dear Copperfield, like time and tide, waits for no man. <laughs> mm. 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 Ah... It is at the present moment in high flavour. I drink to the days when my friend Copperfield and myself were younger and fought our way in the world side by side. We twa ha run about the braes and pooed the Gowans' fang. <laughs> I am not exactly sure what Gowans may be, but I have no doubt Copperfield and myself would frequently have taken a pull at them if it had been feasible. <laughs> now, my friends, a toast to the young lady, unknown, whom my friend Treadles oh. has honoured with his affections. Her name is Sophie. To Sophie. <laughs> to Sophie. Oh. I'm very much obliged to you, and I do assure you, she's the dearest girl. 
And now, my dear friend Copperfield, our host, nothing will deprive me of the impression that he loves and is beloved. No, I, I assure you... Copperfield, I'm convinced of it. Come, be open with us. Well, then, I... I give you D. Oh, oh I knew it. To D. D. <laughs> <laughs> Micawber, hmm? our twins wish you'd return. The hour is late. Emma, my love, you recall me to my paternal duties. <laughs> Copperfield, will you forgive us? We must not forget our innocent offspring. Of course. I understand. Uh, Mrs. Micawber, you're sure? Oh. Thank you, Mr. Copperfield. Good night, my dear friend. May I congratulate you on a very convivial evening. A most delightful reunion. <laughs> One moment. This letter. Read it at your leisure, my dear friend. Good night again. Good night. Good night, Mr. Copperfield. A splendid evening, Copperfield. <laughs> oh, wait a moment. Traddles, hmm? Mr. Micawber doesn't mean any harm, poor fellow. But if I were you... I wouldn't lend him anything. <laughs> I haven't got anything to lend. You've got a name. Oh. Well, uh, I'm afraid I've lent that already. For a bill? Yes. <sighs> I hope there'll be nothing wrong about it. I hope not. I shouldn't think so, though. He told me only the other day that it was provided for. Oh, really? Mm, that was Mr. McCorber's expression. Provided for. Mr. Trevor! Coming! Good night, Copperfield. Sir, for I dare not say, my dear Copperfield. Oh, no. It is expedient I should inform you that the undersigned is crushed. An individual employed by a broker is in legal possession of the premises under a distress for rent. His inventory includes not only the chattels and effects of every description belonging to the undersigned, but also those appertaining to Mr. Thomas Traddles, lodger. If any drop of gloom were wanting in the undersigned's overflowing cup, it would be found in the fact that a friendly acceptance granted to the undersigned by the aforementioned Mr. Thomas Traddles for the sum of twenty-three pounds, four shillings and ninepence halfpenny is overdue and is not provided for. It is superfluous to add that dust and ashes are forever scattered on the head of Wilkins Micawber. <sighs> Poor Traddles. Why, Daisy! <laughs> Have I detected you in another feast, you sybarite? Well, I... Are you dumbfounded? I, I'm so surprised. I didn't expect to see you. How are you, my bacchanal? Very well. I'm not at all bacchanalian, though I confess to another party of three. you never guess who was one of them. No. Traddles. Thomas Traddles from Salem House. Oh, that fellow. Is he as soft as ever? Where the deuce did you pick him up? I met him at a dinner party. He's the best fellow in the world, Steerforth. I was very glad to see him again. <laughs> well, I'd have been glad to see him too. Even though he was an odd fish. <laughs> Daisy, can you give me anything to eat? Oh, of course. Um, there's a pie of, of sorts. Good. I'm devilish hungry. <laughs> I've just come from Yarmouth. I thought you'd come from Oxford. No, I've been better employed. I've been seafaring. The remains of our feast... I wish it were more. Why, it's a supper for a king. <laughs> <laughs> Littimer was here earlier to inquire for you. He thought you'd be here. Well, then he's a greater fool than I thought him. <laughs> Your health, Daisy. <sighs> so, you've been at Yarmouth. Were you there long? No, a week or so. How are they all? Oh, uh, I haven't seen much of them. Of course, little Emily isn't married yet. Not yet. Oh, by the by, I've got a letter for you. Oh? Uh -huh. From whom? Your old nurse. Old what's-his-name's in a bad way. Barkis, you mean? Yes. It's all over with poor Barkis, I'm afraid. Here's the letter. Thank you. Yes. 
Yes. I'm afraid you're right. It's a bad job, but people die every minute. If we failed to hold our course because death was knocking at some door, the world would stop. No. Ride on. Rough shod if you must, smooth shod if that'll do, but ride on. Ride on over all obstacles and win the race. And win what race? The race you've started in. <laughs> I tell you what, Steerforth, if your high spirits will listen to me... They'll do whatever you like. Then I'll tell you what, I think I'll go down and see Peggotty. I can be a comfort and support to her. Wouldn't you go in my place? Well, go. You can do no harm. I, I suppose you won't come with me. Nope. I'm for Highgate tonight. Are you intending to go tomorrow? Yes. Then leave it till the next day. I wanted you to come to us for a few days. I came on purpose to ask you, and now you're flying off to Yarm. <laughs> you're a nice fellow to talk of flying off. You're always running wild on some unknown expedition or other. Say you'll come to Highgate with me tomorrow. Who knows when we may meet again. Very well. I will. I mentioned to Mr. Spenlow in the morning that I wanted leave of absence for a short time. And I took the opportunity to ask after the health of his daughter. Sir, I... Yes? I... What is it, Copperfield? I hope Miss Spenlow is quite well. Yes, thank you. My daughter is very well. He replied with no more emotion than if he'd been speaking of an ordinary mortal. We arrived at Highgate in time for lunch. Mrs. Steerforth was pleased to see me. Rosa Dartle did not seem displeased, but I noticed that she kept a close and attentive watch upon me. I shrank before her strange eyes. When we all went walking in the afternoon, she closed her thin hand on my arm like a spring to keep me back, while Steerforth and his mother went out of earshot. Isn't he a little more remiss than usual in his visits to his blindly doting mamma? Yes. Miss Dartle, please don't think that I... I don't. I only ask a question. Then it's not so. Well, I'm glad to know it. It certainly isn't the fact that I'm responsible for Steerforth's having been away from home longer than usual. I haven't seen him for a long time until last night. No. Indeed, no. What is he doing? What? What is he doing? In what is that man Littimer assisting him, who never looks at me without falsehood in his eyes? I... I don't ask you to betray your friend. I only ask you to tell me. Is it anger? Is it hatred? Is it pride? Is it some wild fury? Is it love? What is it that is leading him? Miss Dartle, believe me, I can think of nothing. I believe there is nothing. I hardly understand what you mean. I swear you to secrecy about this. <laughs> Dear Rosa, be kind for once and sing us that Irish song. Let me alone. <gasps> well, have you ever seen such a fierce little piece of incomprehensibility? What has upset her? Oh, heaven knows. She is an edge tool. One should use great care in dealing with her. Well... It passed the time. <laughs> it's late, I see. Yes, and I must leave early. I think perhaps You're I... You're going to bed? I think so. Good night, my dear Steerforth. I'll be gone before you wake in the morning. Daisy. Yes? Daisy, if anything should ever separate us, you must think of me at my best. You have no best for me, Steerforth, and no worst. You are always equally loved. God bless you, Daisy. And good night. At dawn, before I left, I looked into his room. He was fast asleep, lying easily with his head on his arm, as I'd often seen him at school. 
Let me think of him so again, as in that silent hour I left him. No more, oh God forgive you, Steerforth, to touch that passive hand in love and friendship. Never, never more.